I believe that, like I said, there's going to be a holocaust of the Semitic world, the Semitic people, the Arabs and the Jews will be destroyed. And I suspect that Europe <clears throat> is going to be a part of this uh, genocide. I think that the Europeans will rise up to attack Israel. Uh, and why do I think this? Well, the main reason is <clears throat> because I have historical precedents for this. Um, no one got closer to exterminating the Jews than the Germans did. The Germans were the closest to exterminating the Jews. They almost exterminated all the Jews in Europe. They got the closest. The, in fact, the Germans, they did something that the Muslim world never got close to, and that was just fully exterminating the Jews. Um, the Muslim world focused more, when it came to the Jews, the Muslim world focused more on getting money from the Jews. The Muslim world focused more on getting the jizzy attacks from the Jews, treating the Jews uh, as dimmies, um, maintaining the Jews uh, as being in dimmy status. Uh, yes, there were pogroms against Jews done by the Islamic world, and there were massacres of the Jews done by Muslims. This is the reason why the Jews left the other Middle Eastern countries to go into Israel. Um, when Israel was uh, forming as a brand new country. Um, but it was nothing like what happened with the Jews in Europe. This is the reason why the Israelis talk about the Holocaust all the time. Part of the identity of an Israeli is the Holocaust. And I'm not saying that they praise the Holocaust or anything like that, but they looked, they referenced the Holocaust when talking about their Israeli identity in the sense that we were almost exterminated. We were almost wiped out. We need this country as a refuge from those who hate us. So the Holocaust is an integral part. It is a part of the Israeli identity that cannot be removed from that identity. Why? Why is it so significant? Because it was the greatest massacre of the Jews in history. There was nothing like it. So there is a historical precedent, and it wasn't just the Germans who were involved. It was the Ukrainians who were involved. It was the Croatians who were involved. Uh, there were m multiple people involved, multiple Europeans involved, multiple European nations, I should say, who were involved in the, in the extermination of the Jews in Europe. So there's that. There's that historical precedent that I have, that we have when we, when we observe these things. And the other thing also is the political discourse that has been going on in Germany, I should say, within the last um, seven or eight years or so, almost a decade. Uh, let's just say within, within this decade and in the second half of the last decade, political discourse in Germany... Uh, has been shifting, and we've been seeing this shift continue on, shifting towards not so much being a complete ally of Israel. Uh, yes, I know that Olaf Scholz has said that Germany is on the side of Israel, but that's because <laughs> that's because Israel just had its greatest massacre in its modern history as a nation, um, and Germany having that history of almost exterminating the Jews is expected to say that they're on the side of Israel. Because imagine if Germany said, oh, you know, F Israel, they deserve it. It, it would be, it would be, a, a, I mean, a, it, it wouldn't look too good for the Germans. So, but if you look at, if you look at some of the political, political discourse in the German defense world, or in the, I should say, in the think tank world of German defense, so not so much the German military, but the ideologues who are in the think tank industry of Germany, you will see that there has been a lot of talk of Germany becoming more and more independent. There has also been uh, talk about Germany uh, in the future uh, not relying on America for security and therefore Germany having to see the Middle East as its neighbor and as part of Germany's security interest. So in other words, 
in the future, we're not going to be able to trust the Americans so much. So Germany is going to have to become a global power. So where does that leave Germany in regards to the Middle East? The Middle East is Germany's southern neighbor. So Germany will have to go to the Middle East to expand its hegemony. And I want to show you guys some papers that I've been reading that have talked about this, that have that that have actually described the Middle East as Germany's southern neighbor, that uh, that Germany needs to see as its realm of interest. When you look at that, you have to ask yourself the question, you know, where does that leave Germany in regards to Israel? Because the Germans have not, uh, you know, the, Ger the German population is not so much um, pro-Israel as uh, some would like to think. There's a lot of Germans who hate Israel, a lot of Germans who are pro-Palestine. And I'm not even talking about Muslim Germans. I'm talking about white Germans who aren't Muslim. A lot of them are very pro-Palestine. So uh, I want to recount to you guys a story from my own life. When I was in high school, I had a teacher. She was a history teacher. She was a German, American-German woman. She spoke German. And uh, she was a U.S. citizen, but she was ethnic, ethnically German. I think uh, she had family in Germany, maybe. I don't remember. But she spoke German. And she lived in Germany as a teacher. She was teaching, I think, English in Germany for years. And I remember uh, one day we were in class, and she was talking to me about how Germany is. And I remember she told me, uh, she told me, she said, the young people in Germany are tired of hearing about the Holocaust. And I was a little bit shocked by that. But she said that the young people, they don't want to hear about the Holocaust anymore. They're tired of hearing about the Holocaust. That's it. They're just, they're burned out. Stop talking to us about the Holocaust. And that was back in 2005. I want to say late, it was, yeah, 2005, it was either late 05 or early 2006. But I, I want to say roughly around 2005, this is when I heard this. So I was hearing this from somebody who was living in Germany, or who had lived in Germany as a teacher, and who spoke German. And she was telling me this. So uh, a couple of days ago, I was reading this article, and I want to show you guys this, this article here, written by a Russian, or sorry, written by a German uh, think tank Middle East analyst. She is considered to be Germany's top Middle East analyst. Her name is Muriel Asseberg, and she did an interview in 2015, so about roughly 10 years after... Um, roughly 10 years after I heard that German woman tell me that people in Germany are tired of hearing about the Holocaust. Now, when people... Now, Germany and Israel's relationship is almost completely, and I want to say completely, based on the Holocaust. Now, you could say, well, that's crazy, but it's not. Because it's the fact that Germany almost exterminated all the Jews. It's for that reason that Germany is expected to be pro-Israel and to be friendly with Israel. Hey, you massacred these people. You massacred their grandparents. You massacred their great-grandparents. You need to be nice to them. That's pretty much what, what it comes down to when it comes to the German-Israeli relationship. Because before the end of World War II, the relationship between Germany and the Jews was it would be an understatement to say that it wasn't very nice, okay? It was genocidal. They genocided the Jews. So the Germans are expected to be nice. So what happens when the Germans stop caring about the Holocaust? Ask yourself that question. What happens when the Germans stop uh, being concerned about the Holocaust? They're tired of hearing about the Holocaust. What happens? What happens then is that relationship between Germany and Israel deteriorates. Because at that point, it's who cares. All right, so here's the interview. This is from 2015. And this is an interview with Muriel Asseberg. I call her Asberg. 
because it just sounds funny. Okay, so the time when Berlin was a kind of broker for Israeli interests in the EU is coming to an end. So the interviewer is asking her, like, do you think that this Israeli relationship between Germany and Israel, do you think that it is coming to an end or that it's disintegrating somehow? And Muriel Asaberg says, there is at least a gradual shift here. Now, she said this back in 2015, so that was years ago. Okay, that was over half a decade ago. But she says, there is at least a gradual shift here, but so far, no fundamental change in Berlin's attitude. It is no longer the case that Berlin is always automatically on Israel's side. A common European stance often takes precedence here. So she's saying that there's a gradual shift. It's gradual. It's not fast. And it is gradual. There's a gradual shift. She says there's no fundamental change, meaning there's no major change. But nonetheless, it is no longer the case that Berlin is always automatically on Israel's side. So she connects this to the Holocaust, to Germany's uh, view of the Holocaust. How does Germany see the Holocaust? So she says here, where, where my mouse is pointing, incidentally, this is an area in which opposing trends in education have a strong impact. While the significance of the Shoah, meaning the Holocaust, in the minds of citizens in Germany is decreasing, it remains a very strong constant in the Israeli education system. So what is she saying here? She's saying this in the context of Israel's and Germany's differing views on how Israel should go to war. Germany doesn't like it when Israel bombs the Palestinians. Israel doesn't really care because the Israelis have been attacked by Islamic terrorists, Palestinian Islamic terrorists. So the Israelis say, never again will we ever go through a Holocaust. This is, this is why the Holocaust is such, it's such an unbreakable part of the Israeli psyche, the Israeli um, identity. And, and, and it should be this way. All right. I'm not, I'm not condemning it. You know, for some reason, when you say things like this, people think you're condemning something. I'm not condemning it. I completely understand. I, I, I would have the same exact mentality if I was an Israeli. It would never leave my mind to, 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 uh, for, it would never leave my mind to remember the Holocaust. All right. And it's like, it's like going to somebody in Poland and telling them to forget about the fact that Hitler controlled Poland. Polish people, Polish people, I don't think we'll ever forget about this, and neither should they. Uh, Polish people still remember what the communists did. Polish people still remember what the Nazis did. Polish people still remember what the Ukrainians did. It's a it's a part of their identity. Going to Serbia, it's the same thing. The Serbs still talk about the Ustasha. No, the greatest massacre of Serbs ever done was done not by the Ottomans. It was done by the Ustasha, by Croatian Nazis, people who look like Serbs and who speak the same language as Serbs, committed the and ethnically speaking are the same people as the Serbs, they committed the greatest massacre of the Serbs. It wasn't the, the Ottomans. The Ottomans killed a lot of Serbian people, don't get me wrong, but it was the Ustasha who did the most horrendous violence to the Serbian people in the history of the Serbian people. And the Serbs have never forgotten it and neither should they forget about it. So what she is saying here is that remembering the Holocaust is still a part of, is still a constant part of the Israeli identity. So in the Israeli mentality, a Holocaust should never happen again. That's, that's, that's where the, the saying comes from. Never again, right? Never again will we go through a Holocaust. So Hamas, uh, ISIS, uh, Iran, they want to do another Shoah. They want to do another Holocaust. And we will never allow this to happen. So we are so adamant about preventing another Shoah that we will bomb the Palestinians to make sure that they never, ever become confident that they can annihilate us. This is the Israeli mentality. So she is saying here, this Israeli mentality is connected to the Holocaust. But in Germany, we no longer we don't care so much about the Holocaust anymore. So what happens? This is very interesting. In the German mentality, it's never again will the Holocaust ever happen. 
So therefore, we have to use strong military force against the Palestinians. The German mentality is, we don't care so much about your Holocaust anymore, so why are you being so brutal with the Palestinians? Well, because of the Holocaust. The Holocaust that you assholes started. Yeah, but we don't really care so much about that anymore. So why are you guys being so mean? And this is the this is the conundrum. This is the, the predicament that is occurring, that is transpiring. But this woman, Muriel Asseberg, she's saying, well, the Germans don't really care so much about the Shoah. And she doesn't care so much about it herself. In fact, I would argue that she doesn't care about the Holocaust at all. She don't give a damn. This woman doesn't give a damn about the Holocaust. Why? Muriel Asseberg is extremely pro-Palestine. And I, it, it's amazing. It's really amazing to see this happening. But she's extremely pro-Palestine. She's very influential. She is considered to be the top analyst in the for the German government when it comes to the Middle East. And she is saying that Palestinians have a right to resist Israeli occupation. She says, which means she is, she's okay with terrorism. Because in the Palestinian mind, uh, resist is to kill Israeli civilians. Um, in her mind, Israel is responsible for war crimes. Yes, war crimes. According to, Ari to Muriel Asseberg, Israel is responsible for war crimes. Okay. So what does she want to do? Let's go to another document here. So here is the paper written in 2021, the need for new concepts to address conflicts in Europe's broader southern neighbor. Now remember, remember, and this is this is addressed to uh, Vehicle Simic here. Vehicle Simic says Germany has a lot of money. Maybe they don't need a military. That's 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 impossible. You can have all the money in the world. You need a military if you want to be a force for global power. Like it's just impossible. You can't have that without a military. Uh, Germany does have a lot of money. It's one of the most wealthiest nations in the world. So therefore, they have the financial power to make a powerful military. Um, <laughs> uh, remember, uh, Vyko Simic, you live in Serbia. And in Serbia, during the war in the 1990s, between the Albanians and the Serbs and Kosovo, let's not forget that it was the Germans and I know this because I've read about it, but I also, the person who informed me about this fact was somebody who fought in the war in the 1990s. He was a veteran of the Yugoslav military. It was the Germans who backed the KLA. It was the Germans who armed and trained the KLA. It was the Germans who were the most enthusiastic in the Western world about bombing the Serbs. It was the Germans who were pushing the Americans to do a military intervention. And that was Germany's way of awakening from the ashes of World War II. This was back in the 1990s, so World War II was still very fresh in people's minds. The Holocaust was extremely fresh in people's minds. But Germany wanted to awaken from its, its devastation, the devastation of its loss in World War II. And that was Germany's way of reawakening. America won't let them make a military. That is no longer the case. More and more, it is no longer the case that America won't, won't allow Germany to make a military. And you're going to see it. As the years go by, the Germans are going to make a very strong military, and you already see the Germans integrating their their military with other Europeans. So let's go back. And, and the thing is that the Balkans are in the south. They're part of Germany's southern neighborhood. So the Germans are thinking, okay, America is going to let, let uh, America is going to recluse itself from its position as the world's police, what is what is Germany going to do? That is the question. That, but that's the question. What is Germany going to do? If America is not there to run the world and you no longer have a unipolar world, which is what the Russians want. The Russians want the unipolarity to end. They don't want a unipolar world anymore. 
because the Russians know. Once you no longer have a unipolar world, then Russia can have more space to do what it wants. So, but if you don't have America there, you have to ask yourself the question. If you, let's say you're Germany, you have to ask yourself, what do we do? What do we do? We have to counter the Russians. We have to, we have to make ourselves to be a superpower again. So we have to look at the Middle East. We have to look at Southern Europe. We have to look at Eastern Europe. So it talks about the partial retreat of the United States. They are responding. So she's talking about these uh, authors, especially uh, Muriel Asenberg here. She says, Russia and a growing number of regional powers are increasingly willing to intervene in conflict hotspots from Syria to Libya. From the Caucasus to the Horn of Africa and the Central African Republic, they are responding to the partial retreat of the American hegemon while also actively pushing back on the influence of the United States. So the retreat, now this, this is the line that I'm focusing on here, the partial retreat of the American hegemon. In other words, Russia is rising because America is retreating. So what happens when America is gone as a hege as a hegemon? What what happens? Germany has to become a superpower. It's just that simple. Nobody wants to talk about this because it's scary or it just sounds crazy, right? And nobody wants to be seen as scary or nobody wants to be seen as crazy. Oh, you're crazy talking about the revival of Germany. No. Listen, when I was in high school, nobody thought that Heert Wilders was going to get anywhere. Now Heert Wilders is dominating <laughs> the Dutch parliament. Nobody thought that Vox party would get anywhere. Now Vox is one of the biggest parties in in, in uh, Spain. Uh, Sweden Democrats were seen as far-right uh, nutcases, far-right extremists. Now they're the second biggest party in Sweden. The world is changing. The world that we that we got accustomed to, which took which formed after the Second World War, that world is ending. That's the bottom line, guys. That world is ending. So, Vehicle Simich says, remember, yeah, I remember, but they didn't have a real army in Kosovo. But that's not my point. I didn't say they had a real army. I said they backed the KLA, which they did. And my point is that that was their way of slowly creeping out from their uh, their position as a defeated nation. That was their way of slowly coming out and trying to have some influence in the Balkans. you got, you got to start somewhere. America sent an actual yeah and and and, and America was uh, America sorry Germany was pushing America to bomb Serbia I love the reference to the Lord of the Rings I just with this music in the background it's just perfect I love it <laughs> I love it <laughs> reminds me of the Lord of the Rings and El when Elrond says to Gandalf in private my people the elves are leaving these shores who will you look to after we're gone yeah that's beautiful reminds me of Elden Ring oh yeah so let's look at so let's look at some more stuff here we're having a very good discussion, guys. This is a very good conversation. We have Simich. We have people quoting uh, Lord of the Rings. This is we're, we're, this is this is fun. We're having a good Friday night here. Uh, <laughs> people say, "Ted, why aren't you married?" If I were married, I wouldn't be able to do these Friday live streams without somebody, uh, you know, without without some kind of uh, hindrance possibly coming up. Oh, you know, uh, uh, the we ha you know we, we have a date night or something like that. If we have date nights on Friday, I won't be able to do these Friday streams. I'll have to do it on Wednesday night or some lame day like that. And who the hell wants to, who the hell wants to go through that? I don't. So anyway. The current conflicts in Europe's broader southern neighborhood reveal a deep crisis of regional uh, of regional orders amid an emerg amid an emergency multipolar polar ugh, multipolarity. Effective conflict transformation in the broader southern neighborhood is in Germany's. Now check this out. This is very interesting. Effective conflict transformation in the broader southern neighborhood is in Germany's own interest in order to avert 
negative repercussions and provide a convincing alternative to the offers of illiberal actors. In other words, the South is full of conflict, the Middle East, so Germany has to be a force for stability. So what is the, what is, there's a lot of violence in the Middle East, but what is the area of the Middle East that the whole world focuses more on, focuses on more than any other place in the Middle East? It's Israel. That is the area of the Middle East that the whole world focuses on. You can have a war between the Arabs and the Houthis. You could have a war between the Syrians. You could have war between the Lebanese, uh, Lebanese civil war. Uh, you could have uh, uh, her horrific violence taking place in Iraq. Nothing grabs the world's attention when it comes to the Middle East more than a war between Israelis and Palestinians. There's nothing. We had a there was a brutal war between the between the Saudis and the Yemenis. How many thousands upon thousands of people starved to death because the Houthis were blocked, were stealing the food that was going into Yemen? So when it comes to the Middle East, what do people focus on more than anything else? It's the Israelis versus the Palestinians. So here she is, and this woman is obsessed with Israel. This Ariel. Um, uh, Muriel Asseberg woman. Am I pronouncing her name correctly? Sorry. Um, Muriel. Muriel Asseberg. She's obsessed with Israel. She talks about she talks about Israel more than any other uh, country when it comes to her Middle East analysis. Civil wars in the broader southern neighborhood are unlikely to give way to lasting peace if human rights violations and war crimes are not dealt with by the actors involved. So she sees the Middle East as Germany's southern neighborhood. So if Germany needs to focus on stopping conflict in, the, in, in its southern neighborhood, the Middle East, what conflict do you think Germany is going to focus on more than anything else? It would be a conflict between Jews and Arabs. And so she is saying that Germany is going to, with, with, with America, you know, leaving its position, with America retreating, with the unipolar world uh, breaking down, with the world becoming more and more of a multipolar world, Germany has to focus on conflict resolution in its southern neighborhood. And I have to really put a lot of effort into explaining this because... Uh, what I'm predicting here, what I'm talking about here, is something that no one really thinks about, and that is Germany being involved in another Holocaust in the future. And I, you, in order to really explain this to people, you gotta, you gotta show information. You gotta really break things down. Civil wars in the broader southern neighborhood are unlikely to give way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is a need to deter potential criminals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, she sees the Israeli government as guilty of war crimes. And so she says here, in such cases, the international community can contribute to investigation of an accountability for crimes. One feature of internationalized conflicts um, is that prosecution by the International Criminal Court or International Special Tribunals is often impossible because permanent members of the UN Security Council are involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So she's saying that we really can't rely on the ICC. So what do we do? So she says, Germany could take a pioneering role in several respects. First, by consistently supporting the prosecution of alleged war crimes, etc., etc. Okay, let's, let's fast forward here. Third, by supporting court-proof documentation of war crimes by civil society and international organizations, etc., etc. And by expanding the capacity of its own law enforcement agencies. So Germany can expand its law enforcement agencies into other countries. Such a pioneering role would correspond both to Germany's interest for lasting stability in its broader neighborhood and its interest in strengthening a rules-based multilateral order. It would entail a greater emphasis on criminal justice and thus a relocation of resources. Criminal prosecutions, especially in complex conflicts, are anything but low-hanging fruit that can be readily reaped, etc., etc. And look what she says here. Germany can only, uh, can only credibly act as a pioneer if it consistently fulfills this role. 
This implies that criminal prosecutions do not stop with the nationals of friendly states. See, for example, the ICC investigation into suspected war crimes in the Palestinian territories. So she's talking about how Germany can expand its its law enforcement into its broader southern neighborhood, the Middle East, to stop war crimes and to bring war criminals to justice. And look at what she brings as an example. War crimes in the Palestinian territories, which is a reference to the Israeli government. So if I know this is very difficult for people to think about because the idea of um, the idea of of Germany coming back and, and, and being scary again uh, is inconceivable to most people. You know, they they we we um, we reduce that historical thought to uh, movies, you know, Schindler's List. Things like that. Um, but uh, if you think about the future and think about what the future holds, uh, we can actually see that the idea of a revived Germany, even against the Jewish people, is not uh, far-fetched or adventuresome. You know, and I and I don't have like the this white paper leaked out. It says, "Oh yeah, this is what's gonna happen," and blah blah. Like I don't have that with me, right? I don't have that with me. But I'm simply trying to put the pieces together here, and then coming to some sort of not a conclusion because none of this is really it, it's not conclusive because it hasn't happened. But we can come to I think an educated guess as to what can happen. Think of it. Think of it like this. Imagine in the future you have uh, a world that is not under the American hegemony as much anymore, right? America has retreated. America has gone back to its old legacy of of uh, isolationism. What's going to happen? You have, on top of this, Jewish extremism, Islamic extremism. Jews and Arabs are killing each other. Germany used to have a great empire. Germany is in competition with Russia. Russia wants the Middle East. Germany sees the Middle East as its southern neighbor. Violence between Arabs and Jews would then be seen as an opportunity for the Germans to intervene in the Middle East. And in under the, the pretense of bringing stability and 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 being a force for peace germany enters israel and it does so to support the palestinians this is just a scenario that uh that i could see happening from there israel uh from there uh germany Backed with its uh, ally, uh, Turkey, commences to do another Holocaust. Commences to resume another Holocaust. Sounds crazy. It, it, it sounds absolutely mad, right? To a lot of people, this sounds mad. But, you know, the Holocaust sounds crazy. You know, it's amazing. If I, if, if we were living in the 1920s and I told you I told you that the Germans are going to exterminate the Jews you would think that I was crazy right? you would think you're crazy because the Jews in Germany had a very comfortable life Jews living in Germany were they a lot of them were very successful uh, they had good lives and the Jews in Germany would have thought that you were crazy. The Jews living in Germany would have thought that you were crazy if you would tell them that. I know this because years ago I wrote a book called Days of Our Years. Days of Our Years. Uh, I, I read a, a little bit of another book called The Forgotten Ally. Both of these books were written by the same author. His name is Pierre von Passen. He was a Dutch journalist who interviewed Hitler when, Hit when Hitler was campaigning for uh, and for um, 
his election in Germany. And Pierre van Passen interviewed Adolf Hitler after one of his campaign speeches. Sounds crazy, I know, but this is what happened. And Pierre van Passen spoke with Hitler and confronted Hitler on his anti-Jewish sentiment. And Hitler looked at Pierre van Passen and yelled at him and said, how can you as a Dutchman, as an Aryan, support the Jews? Pierre van Passen, after this interview, he eventually went to New York City and he was invited to speak for a major synagogue in New York. And while he was speaking in the synagogue, he told the audience, he told the audience, I spoke with Adolf Hitler and I looked at his eyes and I can tell you right now, he is going to take power in Germany and under him, every Jewish tombstone will be shattered within 10 years under the Third Reich. He said this to a crowd of Jews in New York City in a synagogue. After the speech, somebody approached Pierre Van Passen and said, a man wants to speak with you. So he went to this other room in the synagogue and there was a Jewish man in the room who was very, who was very wealthy. And he told Pierre Van Passen, I listened to your speech and I can say right now that I completely disagree with what you are saying. And Pierre Van Passen said, well, why did you say that? And this man said to him, because Germany is still Germany, civilization will always be civilization. Germany will always be Germany. Germany will not turn into this savage barbarian uh, country that you say it will become. And that was it. And that man was dead wrong. People thought it was crazy for Passen to say those things. But as Veiko Simic says here, a wolf changes its fur, but never its temper. Old Serbian saying. Yeah, absolutely. So this woman is saying, Asseberg, she is saying, Germany should go into its southern neighbor to stop war criminals and to stop war crimes. How do you do that without a military? How do you do that? She says, we can expand our law enforcement agency into other countries. How do you do that without a strong military? That's like saying America is going to go into Somalia to, to stop General Adid, to bring him to justice. General Adid was a war criminal. America could not have gone into Mogadishu without a military. It's impossible. And she is saying, oh, we have to stop war crimes. And she lists as an example, war crimes in the Palestinian territories. That, that is basically a way of, uh, a way, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sneaky way to say Germany should enter Israel in the name of fighting war crimes. Well, when have we heard that kind of tactic? Let's go into Iraq in the name of fighting terrorism. Uh, Turkey says, let's go into Syria in the name of fighting Kurdish terrorists and fighting Bashar al-Assad. That was Turkey's way of expanding. Uh, Germany said, let's uh, support the KLA. You mean just like Germany supported Albanian fascists during the Second World War? You mean just like Germany supported Croatian and Bosnian nationalists during the Second World War? Yeah, just like that. A repetition of history. And didn't the Germans in World War I do a similar thing in the Balkans? So you see Germany doing this in World War I, World War II, and in the 1990s? This is like saying one day the Vatican's not going to be gay anymore. Oh yeah, the whole pedophile problem in the Vatican, that's, that's gone. Yeah, you go ahead and believe that. So, she, told, she calls for a paradigm shift. A new paradigm shift in dealing with Gaza. A change of paradigm is needed. It should not be a matter of simply making the GRM. And the GRM is um, the Gaza reconstruction mechanism. In other words, allowing products to go into Gaza. So it should not be a matter of simply making the GRM less susceptible to corruption, but rather of protecting the rights of the residents of the coastal strip. In other words, Germany should protect the rights of the Palestinians in Gaza to protect and develop will henceforth be given priority to protect and develop will henceforth be given priority over the security interest of the occupying power 
Well, who is the occupying power? Israel. So she is saying Germany must protect the Palestinians. Even if that means undermining the security of Israel. What does that look like? What does undermining the security of Israel look like? What does it look like? Could be supporting terrorists. And the Germans, they want to increase their military. So when it talks about you know, protecting the Gazans against Israel, what would that mean? That would mean showing a strong military force. That would mean having the capability to use a strong military force. Let's get, let's look more into this again. I want to show you guys a new, a new power, new responsibility. Elements of a German foreign and security policy for a changing world. The world is changing, guys. They know it. They say it right here. The world is changing. This was published by the Stiftung Weissenschaft und Politik, which is like the German um, defense. Let me, let me think. Hold on. German like. In, hold on. I, I, I want to get this right here. It was published by the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. So when it says uh, Stiftung Weissenschaft und Politik, that just simply means German Institute for International and Security Affairs. And it was also published by the German Marshall Fund of the United States or the GMF. The domestic dimension of German foreign policy. German foreign policy will continue to, to deploy the full range of foreign policy instru instruments from diplomacy, foreign aid, and cultural policy to the use of military force. So the Germans, they want to have the capability to use military force. How are the Germans going to be a force of stability and peace in the Middle East without a strong military? And because the Germans sympathize with the Palestinians, because they don't care so much about the Holocaust anymore, could this then mean Germany intervening in Israel in the case of tremendous ethnic and religious violence in Israel and in the West Bank to protect the Palestinians against the Jews? And would that then lead to the resuming of the Holocaust of the Jews by the Germans with their ally Turkey beside them? That's the question. And I know this sounds crazy, but when you look at the history and when you look at the projection for the future as far as the the revival of German power, I think it is an important thing to talk about. I think it's an important concern to have. So it talks about spoiler states here. And it says, however, where spoiler states questions the international order, where they violate basic international norms, and, and the Germans can say this about Israel, such as the genocide prohibition or the prohibition of the use of weapons of mass destruction, where they lay claims to or even attack the common or the critical infrastructure of globalization. In other words, where offers of compromise or dispute resolutions are made in vain, Germany must be willing, must be willing and able to use military power within the framework of collective measures sanctioned by international law in order to be able to protect these goods, norms, and collective interest. So it's saying right there, in the case of countries that are breaking international law, that don't want to compromise, that are just bad, Germany must be willing to use its military. So if Germany sees, just think of, think with me. I know Noah doesn't agree. Some of you guys don't agree with me. Think with me here. You have, an, you have a world that is no longer unipolar. It's multipolar. Germany revived as a power. Germany may, is leading its European bloc. It sees Arabs being massacred by Jewish extremists in Israel. It sees chaos. What is, and then Germany says the Middle East is our neighbor. It's part of our realm. We have to protect the Palestinians. That would mean German soldiers in Israel. And, and given that history, given that history of the Holocaust, given that history, who's to say that a Holocaust won't happen again in Israel? And you will have the Germans and their Turkish ally doing another massacre. 
Sounds crazy. Okay. The growth of Germany's power and influence mean that it must also exercise greater responsibility. For decades, Germany has a consumer of, was a consumer of security guaranteed by NATO and especially by the United States. Today, its allies and patterns expect Germany to become a provider of security, a provider of security, and not only for itself. So Germany is, no, is, is beginning to change its focus, its focus from focusing on itself to focusing on others as well. For all these reasons, German security policy can no longer be conceived otherwise than globally. So Germany has to have a global view. That said, Germany's history, its location, and scarce resources are reasons to be judicious about its specific strategic objectives. This also means that a pragmatic German security policy, especially when costly, longer-term military operations are called for, will have to concentrate primarily on the increasingly unstable European vicinity from Northern Africa and the Middle East to Central Asia. So Germany wants to expand its hegemony into the Middle East. Right there, they're saying it. The need for consultation and at the strategic level will only grow. And here too, the United States will expect, the United States will expect far more input from Europe and Germany. On the military operational level, however, the Europeans will have to get used to the idea that the United States will only will not will not only assume a leadership role less often. In other words, we have to expect that America is not going to be the world's police officer as much anymore, but will also want to participate in fewer joint missions. In other words, we're leaving it up to Germany to be a superpower. Europe and Germany must therefore develop formats for NATO operations that rely less on U.S. contributions. This requires greater investment in military capabilities and more political leadership. Europe in particular will have to provide more security in its own neighborhood. And by neighborhood, it's not talking about just Europe. This is also the Middle East. This is Europe's unique responsibility. And Germany will have to make an investment that is commensurate with its strength. So there you go. They're saying it right there. They're saying we can't rely on America in the future. Germany has to become powerful again. So Florian Schoen wrote this article. He is an officer in the German military's general staff service. And he wrote this in 2021. He said, let me show you guys the quote here. So he says he wrote this article. It's, in, it's titled... The key elements paper on the Bundeswehr, Bundeswehr is the German army of the future, necessary adaptations to security policy challenges. Violence and the threat of violence to enforce interest is once again a political reality in Europe. Okay. Do I have to repeat that line? I'm going to repeat that line. Violence and the threat of violence to enforce interest is once again a political reality in Europe. In other words, we have to have the capability to inflict violence. The annexation of Crimea, the Russian military's deployment near the border with Ukraine, and propaganda videos of new weapons, the new weapon systems provide evidence of this development. In Syria, with Russia's help, a brutal war is being waged against the population. Also, with the calculation of using the refugee movement migrating towards Europe to destabilize the European Union. Meanwhile, China's influence is growing far beyond Asia. Russian and Chinese actions are similar and cooperation between the two countries are becoming closer. Violent extremism is spreading in Africa. Under the impact of these events and trends, Germany is once again focusing more on national and collective defense. But the boundaries with international crisis management are becoming increasingly blurred. So in other words... The world, the world is becoming more violent. Germany has to become militarily capa capable to deal with these problems. So we have the rise of Turkey, the rise of Germany, the retreat of American power, the rise of Jewish extremism, Islamic extremism as well. We have the inevitability of Arab-Jewish violence in the, in the Middle East, in Israel. We have Germany seeing the, the Middle East as its vicinity as its southern vicinity we have turkey wanting to control the middle east we have russia also wanting to control the middle east what's happening right now guys is the buildup of a world war between the very countries who were fighting each other and were and who were involved in world war one and world war two that's what's happening and they had a holocaust of the jews in world war two 
The Turks want to massacre the Jews. They want to invade Israel. They want to massacre Israel. They want to do another Holocaust. Germany already did a Holocaust 80 years ago. That wasn't very long ago. My grandmother was alive, and she's still alive. So who's to say that the Germans won't go back to their old ways? With the rise of nationalism in the midst of all this? It's very scary. It's very scary. Now, let's get to your guys' comments and questions. I will make Israel like a trembling cup to all the nations. Absolutely. That's right. If America withdraws from Europe, there will be again a fight for dominance between EU nations. That's right. At least it looks like that to me. I believe you, yeah. European nations, I think, will fight each other. If he was married, he would need a lot more burdock. Absolutely. If he was married, he would be an alcoholic. Wow. That sounds very... That sounds kind of dark. Who knows what Russia would do in that scenario? Well, didn't the Russians save the Jews during the Holocaust? I think the Russians will do the same thing in the future. Noah says, also, you're talking as if the Israelis don't have a say in what happens on their land. You think Israel is just going to allow foreign troops to invade their territory and not put up stiff resistance? Uh, I'm not saying that they're just going to allow people to go in. I think there's going to be a war. I think Israel is going to be invaded. That's what I think is going to happen. Just like you had a civil war between the Jews and the Romans were, went to war with the Jews, with the Judeans, and the Romans defeated them. And, they, and the Romans massacred a million Jews in the, the uh, Judeo-Roman War. So I'm not saying that they're just going to allow them to come in. They're going to come in, the Turks at least, and, and, and maybe the Iranians are going to come in and they're going to have a Holocaust. The Jews are going to, win, are going to lose a war. That's what I think is going to happen. Russia has a really good player at this game, their president. Vehicle Simbich says, no, it doesn't sound crazy. I don't think it sounds crazy at all. I mean, given the history. Uh, Noah says, this is 2023, not 1923. Well, uh, you know, before the Holocaust, there was a wealthy Jewish man who told the Dutch journalist, uh, who, Pierre van Passen, who was warning about the rise of Germany. Civilization is still civilization. Germany will always be Germany. I mean, you are you are repeating the same mistake that people said in the past. You're, well, you know what? I'm not going to say mistake because it could be that you are right and I'm wrong. I could be wrong and maybe I'll have egg in my face. But uh, I think that it's a mistake to automatically assume that Germany will, uh, will uh, be a good guy in the future. Just as it was a mistake to think that Hitler wasn't going to be um, a genocidal uh, dictator. How does any of this sound any different from <laughs> what the U.S. has been doing in the Middle East for the past 20 years? That's true. It's, it doesn't sound that different. Uh, but nonetheless, we already know what to expect from the American Empire because we've been living under the American Empire for decades. Uh, looking at Germany's history, do you really want Germany to be running uh, the Middle East? Do you, re do you really want Germany to have an empire? We saw the results of this in World War I and World War II. The Germans uh, took over a lot of territory in World War I. The Germans took over a ton of territory in World War II. Look, what, look at what the Germans did in the Balkans. Look at what the Germans did in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Look at what the Germans did in Central Europe. Look at what the Germans did in Northern Europe. Uh, this is like saying, you know, uh, how does this sound so different from... Well, I mean, let me just rephrase. You say, how does it sound different from, from America? Well, not much. The only difference is that it's talking about Germany, not America. Two different countries. I'm not saying America is perfect, but living under America is a lot better than living under Germany. Looking at Just looking at the history. <laughs> Italy ends up reviving the Holy Roman Empire. Nice background music. Yeah, I love it. <clears throat> okay, let's get to drinks, guys. I've done enough uh, talking. <clears throat> 